Hello, I'm Stephen Wellman, Editor-in-Chief of GeekNet Media. I'm here today with James Rangers of Intel Corporation, and we're talking about some of the news coming out of IDF 2012 here in San Francisco, as well as some greater topics related to parallel software development. James, thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. James, in earlier presentations about parallel software development models, you've repeated several times that parallel development solutions need to be platform agnostic, or at least non-specific, and then they need to promote composability or kind of a fit my program and produce portable results. Could you elaborate a little bit on this list of needs for developers looking to better leverage parallel development models? Absolutely. I think <clears throat> we've we've evolved this way with our standard programming languages and really all I'm saying is when we add parallelism to the languages, when we add it to our programs, it, it ought to have the same qualities we expect of our programming languages for non-parallelism. So, you know, you, you don't expect to write a program differently on every platform these days. I mean, not radically differently. So, parallel programming has been something that's always been a little too close to the metal, and that it has several disadvantages. One is portability, but another is just the the ease of uh, of writing it. Um, when you get too close to the hardware, you have to manage a lot of things. And what we've learned over time is, is I think there's a couple of key things we, we know. that uh, One is this concept of composability. Uh, another one is the concept of programming in task, not threads. So composability is a pretty simple concept, um, although sometimes very difficult to realize. Uh, the idea is, is that no matter uh, where in your program you write using a certain construct, uh, you don't need to care what, how the rest of the program is written. Uh, I mean, I'll use a really lame example. If you use a while statement, you don't have to worry about making sure the rest of your program doesn't use an if statement. And that sounds so absurd, but when we get to parallel programming models, uh, it has often been the case that if you write part of your program with some parallelism, you have to be careful other parts don't invoke parallelism or they don't invoke a different type of parallelism. And that's really um, unfortunate and causes a lot of problems. Uh, imagine a library like Intel's math kernel library. We use parallelism in that library to um, be able to do uh, solvers or do matrix multiplies and all sorts of uh, uh, subroutines to do mathematical operations. But just because we're using parallelism there shouldn't affect whether you can use parallelism in your program. Um, and so this composability becomes real important in modular programming or you might have libraries, or you might have sections of programs written by one group versus another, or things that you inherit from uh, other vendors. Uh, it should just all plug together. And we're used to being able to do that with our programming languages, but oddly enough, our parallel programming models haven't supported this very well. Um, so we've really been pushing this. You, you'll see other people doing uh, development that uh, uh, supports this as well. So. Um, there are different uh, things that are being done to make uh, software uh, more compatible. So some of our most modern programming methods like Intel Threading Building Blocks or Intel Silk Plus, or you look at some of the things from Microsoft, their PPL and TPL, they, these become composable models that can be mixed and matched with each other. They can be mixed and matched with themselves. Uh, they can be nested. Um, this is one of the big things I think we missed when we defined OpenMP, is we didn't think enough about the importance of nesting parallelism. So if you have a parallel loop and it calls a function in that loop, can that function itself have more parallelism? And we didn't get that right in OpenMP. And OpenMP has got a number of things that vendors have done to try to mitigate the problem. But if it had been designed differently from the start, this would be, uh, it would be easy and composable. So it's just basically we should be able to mix and match. So the more modern methods allow this. Um, and the other thing I mentioned was uh, write in task, not threads. This is another key learning. Uh, historically, people have programmed very close to the metal. They call something like uh, pthreads on Linux or Windows threads. They, they create uh, threads on their own. They manage them. Usually a program starts up, says, oh, how many cores am I running on? OK, I'm going to create that many threads. Now I'm going to have each thread do something different or coordinated. It's actually, that's a losing battle. Um, what you really want to do is have the programmer focus on saying, here's something to do, here's something else to do, and, and specifying all these items that can be done in parallel, and then let a, um, a runtime, if you will, map that onto the hardware. So I call those tasks. It's like, here's a task, here's a task. Um, and you can think of a parallel four as creating a lot of tasks. Um, if you do a parallel four that iterates uh, a million times, 
that creates a million tasks. Now, 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 it doesn't necessarily have to really create a million tasks, but it creates the potential for a million tasks. But you let the runtime decide at runtime, oh, we're running on eight cores. Let's map a million tasks onto eight cores. And how do you do that? Do you divide up a million evenly and just give each a chunk? That's a static decomposition. Or do you give a smaller amount and then see how it goes and do dynamic load balancing? If you do all of that in every program, you know, write the load balancing, write the algorithms, all that, it's way too much work. What you do is, is you program at a higher level and just say, here's a task, here's a task, here's some tasks. And, and you see this happening. You see threading building blocks from Intel, Silk Plus, uh, again, TPL, PPL from Microsoft. You see Apple's task they've added with their, um, in their operating system um, programming environment. They're all trying to accomplish the same thing. Get the programmer thinking in terms of telling this uh, the potential for parallelism and then let a runtime map it onto the hardware. Incredibly important concepts, ones that uh, I think take parallel programming uh, to a much more um, usable state now instead of uh, having to be micromanaged, you're programming at a higher level. It's sort of like allowing variables instead of programming to the register level in a microprocessor. That makes sense. You also say that popular parallel programming models usually address one, no more than two or three kind of essential requirements for total parallel development, those being scale, vectorization, and or specialization. And you also give things like MPI, mixed report cards, for serving developer needs for composability. Could you elaborate a little bit on what maybe some additional needs are for a parallel a development model? Yeah, if you look at where parallelism exists in the hardware, um, it exists by um, scaling to more and more um, hardware threads, usually by cores, sometimes by threads on the core, but uh, that's one way. Another way is to being able to operate on data, wider and wider data, um, and you need vector, to use vector uh, math to do, do that, you need vectorization. Um, but then I generalize and I start talking about specialization and I, I tend to lose people when I talk about that, but it's a really important concept. Um, scaling hardware threads and scaling wider vectors isn't the only phenomenon we're going to see. We're going to see specialization built into the hardware. We're already seeing it. We're seeing you know, camera devices. We're seeing A to D converters you know, for, on cell phone um, uh, devices. It, there's many specializations that will happen. and. Um, or you see texture maps and GPUs, and, and programmers sometimes say, well, how can I use that? Can I use that to help my programming? And I think in general we're going to see um, a lot of specialized functionality also show up on certain pieces of silicon. Um, and so I think programming should try to address all of these, scaling, vectorization, and specialization. I actually think specialization, we're way too early to figure out how to get programming languages do a great job supporting that. I think you've got some low-level um, things you can do, like OpenCL addresses this, um, that get, enable certain programmers. But I think it'll be a while before we really understand how to integrate that into programming languages. But when it comes to scaling and vectorization, these are not new concepts. <laughs> We're ready to get these into the languages. So yeah, I've been a big advocate for taking a harder look at whether we should have programming uh, support for scaling, better programming support. Well, Apple's kind of taken a, a leap forward with some of their tasking capabilities in Objective-C. Uh, we've got Intel threading building blocks, which is a lot, template library, but there are some real advantages of incorporating in the language like we're doing with our uh, Silk Plus. So I think it's a, it, the time is ripe for a lot of dialogue in the industry about um, whether we add, how, how we add these to programming languages um, and or libraries. The concept of just uh, being able to program in tasks, not threads. And when it comes to vectorization, I give us a very poor report card as an industry on uh, how easy it makes, uh, how easy we're making it to vectorize code. Um, so I think we're going to learn there, there are um, uh, concepts like vector loops that we need to figure out how to incorporate into languages. Um, I think vectorization, writing an efficient program that takes advantage of uh, instructions like SSE and AVX and, and now the 512-bit capabilities of CN5. Doing that in programming language is a little bit of a black art. You can write a loop, hope the compiler auto-vectorizes it, but in order to auto-vectorize it, it needs to get past some of the limitations of the programming language. 
uh, we can do better than that. So we've seen uh, people go from programming these in assembly language to using intrinsics to now I think we're seeing some alternatives exist that are a little bit more portable. Uh, if you take a look at SSE, it's 128 bits wide. AVX is 256. Uh, the Xeon Phi uh, using the mic architecture is 512 bits wide. I don't see much code written in a f fashion that can simply be recompiled and use all three. Uh, what I tend to see is code that's just a little too tailored to a particular size, and that really is um, something programming languages should help us with. Uh, I expect a pretty healthy debate on this in the next handful of years, and I'm hoping to see some things come out of that that make uh, the job easier for programmers. Sort of related to this, some, some critics of the, of the parallel software development model claim that software development is kind of an intrinsically serial and not parallel process and that they've dubbed the concept that you could really build a, a viable and scalable parallel cell software development model as the serial delusion. How would you address those criticisms? I mean, parallel software development seems to have been around for a while now. Uh, people seem to use the tools to uh, speed up the performance of their applications. Why does this criticism of the model persist? Well, I think uh, for a variety of reasons. First of all, um, there's really a huge uh, effect that uh, the way we teach programming and think about programming has on our ability to make that leap to parallel programming. Um, we, we teach a lot of things that reinforce the idea of step-by-step of, uh, -step algorithms, step one, then two, then three. We, we have a lot of things I call uh, serial traps that um, where the programming language construct that we use is, is specifically is serial. Uh, take a for loop. I think a lot of people don't think about this, but when you do for i equals zero, i less than n, i plus plus, um, you, you've said let's run this loop first for i equals zero, then for i equals one, then i equals two. You, you've specifically told the compiler in your programming that it has to be done in order. Um, that doesn't have to be done in that order quite often, and, but yet we don't have a programming construct that says, well, parallel uh, fours, although it's a commonly suggested extension, and we have do concurrent now in Fortran that does exactly that. It says, I don't care what order you do them in. Um, but these, it really um, is pervasive, the, the way that we think about programming. So my counter example is, is we don't think about our whole lives that way. Um, if, uh, if I said, gee, let's go, uh, let's go paint your house. Let's go over, let's paint every room in some building you pick, your house or any building. If you have to do it yourself, you're going to think of it very serially. But if I show up with 10 friends, we're not all going to paint the same wall. That's intuitive. I don't think that's a hard concept. I didn't have to teach you. You didn't go, what do you mean? Can you explain that? Yeah, and you would also realize we need 10 paintbrushes and we need 10 buckets of paint and, and then we'll go paint 10 different walls, right? And you, you, you have an intuition about that. I think we all do as humans. I don't think this is something that's foreign, thinking about how to do things in parallel. So, so I, I don't believe that programming in parallel is a foreign concept to how we can think because I think we think of tons of things in our lives in parallel and it's just intuitive, just natural to us. All right. I think that's a very fair assessment. Let's pivot for a second to uh, IDF here in San Francisco going on this week. Uh, we've heard a lot about Xeon and Xeon 5 in the weeks and months leading up to this show. Still hearing a lot about it at the show. Obviously, we're going to be hearing a lot about it for months uh, to come. What is the real potential this new, uh, this new hardware provides for uh, parallel software developers and applications that wasn't available before? It's, it's amazing because we've seen uh, a general purpose architecture, uh, Xeon, uh, be able to get higher and higher levels of, of uh, performance and parallelism for a long time, but Xeon Phi um, uh, extends that, and it extends it by um, looking at the problem a little differently. Let's assume that all you care about is parallelism, that the only thing you're going to write is a parallel program how would you design a processor differently? And that's what Xeon Phi is. The world's not going to suddenly move to that. The, most general purpose servers need a general purpose processor, a Xeon, that can do both. 
and uh, by doing both means you can run a wide variety of workloads on it and get great performance. But if you suspend for a moment the idea that you want to run everything and you say, I just want to run a parallel program, what can you do? And, and that's Xeon Phi. So it really extends the ability for a power efficient device to really excel on parallelism. But it has a caveat. It, it, it's terrible if you run a serial program on it. It's just, it's, that's not what it was designed for. So our biggest challenge with CN5, I think, is, is helping people understand that it's there to take, to take parallel programming to new heights when you really understand how to, to utilize that. And there are plenty of people out there that understand this. It's, it's amazing the ideas. Uh, some people have scientists and, and uh, chemists, uh, physicists, uh, uh, lots of different uh, computer science ideas of what they can do with that level of parallelism, what new problems you can solve because we're able to get more performance in a smaller space, more power efficient, but only for parallel programs. So don't show up with two or three threads. In fact, if you've got less than 100, don't even apply. This device is too, too uh, powerful or too dependent on that many threads. You can look at it either way. But if you can have a program that scales to over 100 threads and it can use good vectors, this is an amazing device, the Xeon Phi. Otherwise, look at what we're doing with uh, the Ivy Bridge microarchitecture, the future Haswell microarchitecture, the, the Xeons, the compute power on these devices is amazing too. So we're giving more variety for more, more problems. All right, um, I, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. Uh, also hearing a little bit about uh, Intel support for HTML5 here at IDF this week. And I know previously uh, Intel had, had some SDKs available in particular for Android's native apps. And now we're hearing a little bit more about a broader support for HTML5. Uh, does this represent a change on Intel's part or is this more tools for developers of different stripes? I think it expands. Change, no, I wouldn't call it a change, but it's a, it's a great new development. It's, it's, um, there's there's a, a lot of need for compute devices to have a more continuous experience. So, uh, you know, whether I'm using my tablet or my Ultrabook or my desktop machine, uh, whether I borrow the machine you have, it, it would be nice if that had a common experience. And HTML5 has that promise. Um, and I say promise because I think some of the greater criticism of HTML5 is it isn't there yet. I agree. There's no debate about that, uh, or there shouldn't be. It's not completely there, and that's, that's really why Intel's weighing in. We, we see the potential, and we think it needs um, uh, everyone pitching in. So, yes, we, we're talking about more software, um, SDKs from us, but the SDKs are more than just enabling uh, HTML5 itself. It's about making HTML5 a richer environment with more uh, what we would call services. So how do I find out where I am? How do I, uh, how do I do various functionalities that as a user you'd want and as a developer of HTML5 code you'd want to, to offer um, so that across different devices you have the same, same experience? We think that's, that's where we're going. Uh, this concept uh, that Renee talked about in our keynote about transparent computing. It's sort of computing is getting more and more powerful uh, maybe it's about time it's powerful enough it can just sort of blend into our lives that we don't have to take a class how to use a tablet. We don't have to take a class on using a laptop. It just starts to blend in and feel natural. And HTML5, I think, is a very big part of that. Thank you. And then, uh, really, kind of one final question here. You recently wrote a long blog post on Intel Parallel Studio XC 2013. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this new product support for Xeon Phi and the mic architecture? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, Parallel Studio XE is our premier set of tools for software developers, and it's very focused on helping developers uh, get the performance out of the platform. So, compilers, libraries, uh, tuning tools, uh, tools for analyzing uh, uh, bugs or errors in code, everything really that you need, um, but at a higher level of really helping extract the performance out of a platform. And so one of the things 
it includes is support for the latest processors, including ones that haven't been released yet. So we've got uh, support for Haswell microarchitecture, which will show up in products next year. And we have our support for Intel uh, Xeon Phi. And by having that support now, even though those products aren't generally available yet, um, it allows software developers who want their software to be ready when we launch those products uh, to be working on it. Uh, in a very public way. You can buy uh, the Parallel Studio XE now. You can download it, trial versions, uh, and get started. Um, of course, it's of more use to you if you have uh, the hardware today or pre-production versions of it. But um, you can also take a look, read the documentation, and get prepared on the hardware that exists, all, all with the same tools. What, what I'm particularly proud of with these tools are um, Intel Xeon Phi is just another target. So if you know the Intel VTune Performance Analyzer tool, the Intel VTune uh, Amplifier, we call it, uh, if you know that today, you can use it on an Intel Xeon Phi or on an a Ivy Bridge microarchitecture machine, a Xeon, a core, um, third generation core. Uh, you can use it on any of them, and it's, it's the same tool. The compiler is the same compiler. You don't learn a new compiler. You don't learn a new math library. It's just on all of them. And I think that surprises some people, but that's uh, we're really proud of. We've been talking about that that was a promise with Intel Xeon Phi. And now you can go take a look at it. We released the tools. That you can buy them and use them and, and see that it's true. All right. Thank you very much, James Reinders, Intel Corporation, Stephen Wellman here, GeekNet Media. Thank you and have a great day.